A while back, Johnny Rowland and I were on the phone talking, and we got to talking about a favorite subject among gun people, and that was, uh, what are your favorite cowboy guns? And I think a lot of us who are in the gun field uh, sort of grew up on the idea of our Saturday morning heroes or our Saturday evening heroes, depending on age, whether it was movies or television. And some of us were uh, in both cases, really, the movies and TV. And when Johnny and I were talking, I was telling him about my favorite cowboy guns that I've got, and he was saying he'd really like me to do a segment for the shooting show on it. So here I am. As you can see, I'm a Colt man. This is an actual third generation Colt single action army, which has had an awful lot done to it. This started out as a seven and a half inch nickel third generation 45 with a seven and a half inch barrel, as I said, and the standard gutta percha or checkered hard rubber grips and nothing more than that, just a basic gun. And I've been looking for seven and a half third generation for quite some time and I found this one, and it was a nickel, as I said, but I'm not really a big fan of nickel plating. So, uh, over the course of time, uh, we wound up doing a lot of things to this gun. One of the first things was to get the finish changed. And if you're a Colt collector, this will probably break your heart, but since I'm not a Colt collector, and I really wanted the gun for a lot of shooting, I figured this would be ideal. So I had the gun metal life over the nickel plating by my friend Ron Mahofsky at Metal Life Industries in Reno, Pennsylvania. And a metal life finish is an electrostatic chrome binding process, which up until that time I had thought just could be applied over uh, a blued surface where the bluing had been removed and you had bare metal. But in fact, uh, Ron told me that you can indeed put this finish, this electrostatic chrome plating, over uh, nickel plating that's already uh, in position. And so we did that. And the result, according to what Ron said, and according to my experience subsequently, is a finish that's just virtually impossible to defeat. Now I happen to have, as anyone would know who's shaking hands with me, a chronic problem where my hands perspire. And even though I don't drink a lot of caffeine or anything of this nature, my perspiration is very, very acidic. So consequently, I can destroy almost any kind of a finish. This gun that I'm holding in my hands right now has had this finish on it uh, for quite some time, and I handle it constantly. And I've yet to do anything to it that makes it look less than pristine. But I wasn't con content with just having the gun refinished. Got together with Bob Munden, who most of you probably know as being the man in the Guinness Book as the world's fastest gun. And Bob is also a superior gunsmith. And Bob did one of his full race jobs on this gun which means that he did virtually everything to make this gun a lifetime gun and a gun that is going to keep shooting and keep shooting and keep shooting and keep shooting. And it's also very, very fast, a lightened trigger pull and everything you could possibly want in terms of slicking up a single action. But I wasn't quite through yet either. So I got together with the folks at Eagle Grips and I got a pair of black buffalo horn grips put on the gun as well. And I really, really like this black buffalo horn because it's just got a classic sort of elegance to it. And these grips, by the way, have to be actually hand-fitted to the gun so that you'll have the kind of nice, clean fit that I have. And then lastly, I decided to put it into the holster that I'm wearing, which is one of Sam Andrews' gunfighter rigs. And this is obviously not a practical holster if you're riding the range, quote-unquote, but it's a superior holster if you're looking for something that brings back the flavor of yesteryear's Western heroes. Hi. Hi. How are you? Figured we'd do a... Well, as our conversation progressed, Johnny and I got off the subject of single actions, per se, and got to talking about our favorite cowboy-style rifles. And I was telling him that I was so impressed with my Colt single action that I wanted to have a companion piece for it that would utilize the same cartridge. 
Now, in the days of the Old West, the idea of a cartridge swap between your six gun and your saddle rifle was a pretty popular thing. Uh, probably the most popular of those calibers was uh, 4440. Uh, this rifle is not in 4440. This rifle is in 45 Colt. Now, during the period of Western expansion, certainly Winchester could have made a rifle in 45 Colt, but they didn't. Uh, instead, Colt started making a handgun in 4440. But I wanted something that would go with my 45, so I got a Winchester Trapper in 45 Colt. And so it didn't quite exist in the period, but it's close to authentic. And again, though, no, I have a penchant for not necessarily liking factory finishes. And factory finishes, as I mentioned earlier, don't particularly like me sometimes. So what I decided to do was, again, send this, uh, get together with my friend Ron Mahofsky and tell him that, hey, I would like if you could take a Winchester Trapper and if you could do a nice job of slicking up the action a little bit and then could you metal life it for me. And so indeed that's just what Ron did. So many people have looked at this gun and said, gosh, I didn't know that Winchester made a stainless steel lever action. And they don't, at least not as that I'm aware of. However, Winchester does make some superior lever actions and if you want a finish that looks like stainless steel, you can go to the Metal Life electrostatic chrome binding process, just like I did in my six gun. So let's take a moment and let's see how these shoot. Get a holster shot of it. You want it? Okay. When you're through with this one, I'll just turn the rifle around and get a shot of it with the saddle rig ring. All right. I'm here for the shooting show with my friend Mark Strickland and also my business associate Mark Strickland. And one of the times when Mark and I were sitting down, say hi to your mom and dad out there. Hey, right? mom and hi. dad. Uh, one, one of the times when we were one of the times when we were sitting down talking, you were asking me about this gun that I'm wearing right now. I remember the Hecker and Coke SP89. So let me tell you a little bit about it here. I've got it in one of the shoulder holsters that they provide, which is not designed for concealment, of course. It's just designed for handy portability in the field. And this looks a great deal like Heckle & Koch's MP5 submachine gun, which is really considered about the best submachine gun that you can find anywhere. Most of the world's elite counter-terrorist units and uh, special operations groups and what have you and SWAT teams all rely on the MP5 and one of, or one of its variations. But now this, although it looks like an MP5 in the outside, with the exception of the fact it doesn't have any kind of a shoulder stock or anything of this nature, nor does it have any sort of a uh, front uh, hand support or hand grip, but this is actually just a look-alike for it, because on the inside, this gun is set up so it will work semi-automatic only, which is, both of us know, it obviously means that you have to pull the trigger for each shot. And it comes standard with a 15-round magazine, which is no more than you'd have in... Uh, uh, your Taurus pistol or one of my SIGs or something like that. So this is just a basic uh, uh, pistol. It's a handgun, but it's got some peculiarly uh, good characteristics to it. Uh, one of the things about the SP-89, for example, is the weight. The weight of this thing is such that it really stabilizes against the perceived recoil of the 9mm, which isn't that much to begin with. So it's very, very steady. And plus, as I think, you know, uh, even in a distance shot, a camera can pick up. These are some substantial sights, much more so than you'd have on a typical handgun as well. And the combination makes for a gun that is quite enjoyable to shoot, a gun that's quite accurate to use, and has a lot of versatility. This, for example, would be an ideal gun, where, where legal, of course, to keep in an RV 
to keep in an <coughs> aircraft or what have you, because now a version of this gun, but again as a selective fire weapon, all right, with a folding stock, is the personal defense weapon, or one of the personal defense weapons that are used by downed pilots, simply because of the versatility of this thing and the ruggedness. This is a gun that will withstand most, uh, mostly any kind of field conditions that you can imagine. And with the uh, uh, with the SP-89, you've got really the best of both worlds. You've got something that is as stable as a rifle, but yet it's handgun size, and it's quite, quite accurate if you take the time to practice with it. And if you couple it with one of the Heckler & Koch uh, shoulder holsters, where you can carry a couple of spare magazines on the side, and the larger capacity magazines, where legal, are available so that they can be uh, uh, used in this gun as well, you've really got something that's very, very potent. Another, another nice thing about this, too, is the intimidating looks of this gun are fantastic because if this is used as a home defense pistol, which a lot of people use it for, if it's used as a home defense gun and someone breaks into your home and they see you with this, unless they're an idiot, they're going to run in the opposite direction. That's right. And that's, of course, the thing that you want. You know, it's uh, the police the job of the police to nail the perpetrators and your job to just defend your home and hopefully leave the guy away out and he goes. And this is something that hopefully will scare the guy enough he's going to figure, well gosh, this is one of those evil submachine guns or something and he's going to run. But whereas in fact it's just a simple ordinary semi-automatic pistol but of extraordinary capabilities. Sometimes you'll see people making a video and they just have jump cuts, you know, where it looks like the body is just flickered or something, and that looks awful. And it's very, very simple to get around that, to just make these things, and then you just use them to cut. Show me the sides. Sides. tape this guy's show. Uh, can't. Can't Let's get it. It's on satellite. Finally getting him out to us. Yeah, he doesn't do a very good job of that. <laughs> but I will tell him I really need to have this as viewer of flight. I'm here once again for the shooting show with my friend and business associate Mark Strickland. And Mark and I were just talking a moment ago, and I was telling him, I bet you this is one gun he's never seen anything like. Yeah. Uh, what Mark's got in his hands here is a standard Walther P38. Now, this is one of the guns that was a West German uh, police pistol and was turned in, uh, sort of trade in against new Walther pistols. and. Uh, a lot of these guns wound up coming to the United States, and they were a great buy, Mark. I mean, this was great. I know you like to find a bargain in a gun sometimes, and this was just fantastic because these guns were selling for around 250 260 bucks retail uh, with a spare magazine and a full-flap military police holster, and it's just really fantastic. And they were such a good buy that what I did was I got two of them, because right? when I was a kid, uh, I was a big, 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 big fan of The Man From U.N.C.L.E. And I loved that show. And I'd always wanted an U.N.C.L.E. gun. Now, for a while, I had a Walther P-38K, which is a uh, more modern version of the P-38 9mm. And it has a uh, uh, short barrel, and sometimes it was called a Gestapo barrel, because during World War II, some Lugers and some uh, Walther P-38s were cut down so they'd have a snub-nosed barrel. Uh, but that just wasn't quite right for me. And so what I did was I got together with my friend gunsmith Lynn Trapper Alexiou. And Trapper's really well known. He uh, uh, was an expert in terms of uh, firearms refinishing, but these days he's specializing in other aspects of gunsmithing. And he's also got a good sense of humor. So I asked Trapper, hey, if I sent you up a really nice 
Walther P38, and it doesn't have any collector value, so one of these police turn-in guns. Could you, if I told you what I wanted, could you turn it into an uncle gun for me, right? So this took some this took some difficulty on Trapper's part, and he is a patient guy. As you can see in the front here, I've got a basket-style flash deflector, and the barrel has been cut off well past where the barrel is on the one that you're holding, and it's really just right in front of the slide, as it were. And of course, that gets rid of the front sight, like you have on the front of that barrel. So a front sight had to be sweated on here, and then I, after we had the flash deflector on and the front sight. Uh, the first time, I'll be real honest with you, the first time we did it, uh, we got the gun back and uh, the silver solder hadn't been prepared properly, so we're out there getting ready to shoot, you know, and whammo, you know, parts fall off, right? <laughs> so we sent it back to Trap and he fixed it up and it's worked like a charm ever since. And I even connived him into engraving Uncle across the top. And then the grips, I don't know if you notice these or not, but now these are modern Walther P38 grips that are on this gun, but the grips that are on this gun are actual World War II vintage guns, uh, grips, uh, the kind that you'd find on one of the Grey Ghost uh, Walthers that have been offered by Inter Arms in the past. And, you know, I, uh, this, you know, does not have a shoulder stock or an extension magazine or a telescopic sight on it or anything like that, and it's certainly not selective fire, but it is uh, an interesting gun. I've put it in magazine articles several times, and this is one of the guns that uh, people always write to me about. You know, where can I get a gun like your uncle gun? I had a gentleman who called me on the telephone about a month or so ago and said, I found myself a really nice P-38. Now, who could turn it into an uncle gun okay. like yours? <laughs> and uh, it was an interesting show. It was a lot of fun, and we always enjoyed it. And so I've got my very own semi-uncle gun. Yeah, semi-uncle gun. Da -da -da -da. Now we're showing the front sight here, and then we're talking about the gun Mark's holding, which has a full-length barrel, hasn't been cut off in front, and the sight is, of course, on the front of the barrel, on the muzzle, whereas in the case of my uncle gun, we've had to put the sight on the bridge of the slide. And then I talked about this, which I don't think the camera is going to see at all, where it says UNCLE at the top. And then we talked about the grips, showing the difference in the World War II style grips as opposed to the post-war grips like Mark has over here. This is the Seacamp DA-32, the ultimate cognoscenti hideout gun. And by cognoscenti, of course, I mean people who are in the know. Uh, I thought the shoot and show audience might be interested in the Seacamp because it's probably something you've heard about, but it may be something you have yet to see. And the reason for that is these guns are, how should I put it, ridiculously popular. These guns are so back-ordered that the Seacamp company could, I would think, continue making guns from now until doomsday and they wouldn't quite get caught up. The reason for that is that they are so excellent. This may look to be something about the size of a standard 25 automatic, and indeed it is about that size. The first of the uh, Seacamp DA pocket autos was in fact a 25 automatic, but very shortly after that Seacamp stopped making a 25 and went entirely to a much, much better caliber, and that is 32 ACP. This gun is so precisely tuned and so precisely manufactured that it will only function with one type of 32 caliber ammunition. That is the Winchester Silvertip hollow point. And the Winchester Silvertip hollow point 
is as effective as you can get in 32 ACP. Now 32 ACP may sound familiar to you. Uh, if you're a big James Bond fan, you'll remember that uh, in the book Dr. No and in the movie of the same name, uh, M calls James Bond into his office and tells him it's time that he gets rid of his little 25 Beretta and that he gets into a more substantial gun. And of course, the more substantial gun they gave James Bond was only one caliber up. It was in 32 ACP. It was a Walther PPK. Now, I can't help but think that if James Bond uh, in his original incarnation were around these days, M probably would have gotten Major Boothroyd, the character name, to give him one of these little Seacamp DA-32s because it's just as small as the 25 that Bond was getting rid of, but it's much, much more effective. Major Boothroyd, by the way, interesting story with that. Major Boothroyd is really a man by the name of Jeffrey Boothroyd, who is a very, very well-known Scottish gunwriter and gunsmith. And Jeffrey Boothroyd was a big James Bond fan, and so he wrote a letter to Ian Fleming sort of complaining about the fact that James Bond was carrying a little 25 automatic, and he should be carrying something much more substantial. So by way of thanking Boothroyd for his contribution, when Ian Fleming wrote Dr. No and decided to, to in fact change James Bond's armament, he named the character Major Boothroyd. And Major Boothroyd is a genesis for the character Q, whom we see throughout all the subsequent James Bond films. But back to the Sea Camp. This is a neat little gun. It is double action only. It is made entirely of stainless steel. It is totally slick slided. No sights whatsoever. There is an exposed hammer, as it were, but the exposed hammer has no spur. The gun is designed to be slick into the pocket and out of the pocket. And this is about the best way to carry this gun. Certainly it could be used in an ankle holster, but probably the two best ways, I would have to say, would be either as a pocket gun, and perhaps with that in conjunction with a pocket holster, like I have here, this was made by our good friend Thad Ribka, who is, I would say, the king of pocket holsters. And either a pocket holster, like this Thad Ribka model, or uh, perhaps some sort of a crotch holster, some sort of a holster that's designed to carry it down inside the sleeve or suspended from your garments or something of this nature. This is a fine, reliable little handgun. And the 32 ACP silver tip round is a reliable little round, certainly. It's not going to take the place of a full house 9mm or 357 or 38 special, but it is a decent performing round. And this is probably the finest gun of its type that ever has been made. If you can get one, you're well served. <coughs> Red light. What's that? Yeah. down and dirty and then I'll talk with that okay I'll talk with the down and dirty okay let's take it out and put it back in here's what I meant about as I call it perhaps shouldn't a crotch holster this is the Ahern down and dirty size large and as you may or may not know, we have our own holster company uh, making Ahern Tri-Speed holsters. And this is one of our latest products. And this is what I like to call a crotch holster, and probably shouldn't. But it's a holster that's designed to be worn inside uh, your pants, deep inside. Uh, it can be worn down inside the sleeve of a jacket. It can be worn suspended in a pocket. It can be worn in a variety of ways and we provide it with two different attachments. This one simulates a belt loop on your trousers so that you can just let this hang down inside your pants. And the other one, which I think is really the neatest way, is with this alligator clip. It's just like you'd have on a child's uh, uh, mittens or you might have on a pair of suspenders. And with this clip, you have the ability to put the gun virtually anywhere. And 
The holster is designed to be ambidextrous and works great with the C-Camp, which is one of the reasons we made it that way, because I like to carry the C-Camp a lot. And you simply put the gun in the holster, close the security strap. If you wish to turn it around for other handed use, put it in the holster, close the security strap, and the gun hangs right where you put it. And you don't even have to remove the clip or remove the uh, belt loop. You can just simply remove the holster by use of the Fastex buckle. This is a really neat way to carry the uh, Seacamp DA32, if I do say so myself. Here's a gun you don't see every day. It's the Smith & Wesson Model 637. I'm Jerry Ahern for The Shooting Show. The Model 637, now just what is that? You know, I was at a Smith & Wesson press briefing uh, a couple of years ago. I think it was out in Las Vegas at the SHOT Show. And there was a kind of a humorous moment in it. Smith & Wesson was introducing a whole bunch of new models. and. Some of the Smith executives were trying to remember, now what's the number of this gun? What do you call this one? Because Smith & Wesson, as you may know, they make marvelous, marvelous guns, but they also make some really confusing numbering systems for their guns, unless you really understand how they work. And if the number in front of the gun is a six, that means it's stainless steel. And in the case of a Model 37, that would be an airweight version of a blue or nickel-plated Chief's special revolver, the Model 36, okay? Uh, and of course, the famous stainless steel Smith & Wesson J-frame is the Model 60, which looks very, very much like this, and that's all stainless steel. So if this is stainless steel as a number prefix, but it's got a 37 after it, a Model 637, would that be? Yes, it is. It is a gun that has a stainless steel barrel, a stainless steel cylinder, and an alloy frame. Now, this is not a gun that you see every day, as I said a moment ago. And the reason for that is simply that this gun is a limited run special commission gun that was made up for a, uh, a local Georgia gun dealer, as a matter of fact, who decided that they wanted to have a very, very special, special gun. And at the end of this segment, you'll see the name and address of the firm if you're interested in finding out about it. The Model 637. Uh, this could be a very, very appealing gun, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Smith & Wesson has a habit of making uh, what most people would concede to be the finest snub-nosed revolvers people make, generally. Uh, they are inherently accurate, they're reliable, they're compact, and they're lightweight. But some people want a much more lightweight version than an all-steel gun. Consequently, they want to go to the airweight or alloy frame. However, we know that aluminum is not going to rust. The aluminum alloy is not going to rust, but the uh, blued steel parts or nickel-plated steel parts could rust. So actually, this is a very, very sensible combination, putting stainless steel together where needed with aluminum alloy to make a nice lightweight gun that weighs about a quarter of a pound less than the uh, 21 ounces of a standard all steel J-frame of this type with an exposed hammer. Now of course this is a five shot gun and because it is an alloy framed gun you cannot, you should not, you must not utilize plus P ammunition in the gun because you can do damage to the gun. However, there is a perfectly, perfectly suitable thing that you can do. You can get the Federal 125 grain NICLAD jacketed hollow point, which is their chief's special load. When Smith & Wesson had its own ammunition company, the uh, NICLAD load was designed by Smith & Wesson specifically for firing from their two-inch barrel J-frames something that would give effective performance on the target without generating excessive pressures that would destroy the gun. And that is the ideal load. In fact, I would say it's really the only practical load 
for a gun of this type, whether it's a Model 637 or one of the other air weights. The Model 637 could become a collector's rarity someday, I don't know. But it is a very nice, practical, lightweight gun for a woman to carry in her purse, for a man to carry in an ankle holster, uh, for sticking in a pocket if need be. And it's durable, and of course it's a Smith & Wesson, and these work just great. Keep it going. Please.
catch that dragonfly. <laughs> Gotta do that again. Now get out of it after the sixth shot. <laughs> oh, it's nice and safe. Have to get out of it after the sixth shot. All right. I don't know why that's doing that. <laughs> I was hitting the target a little bit. I don't know why it's still piping on the last one. Are you filming me doing this? Hi. I might be accuracy. I'll take the Go top ahead. left. Okay. On five. One, two, three, four, five.
Go. Uh, push the button in the back and then release the clutch pressure. Too much. Too much pressure. <laughs> what it's doing is it's, it's jamming on the.